It's a safe bet that when a high percentage of people buy their very first sleeping bag, they pick something off of a shelf at a discount or general merchandise store. And because these buyers are more likely than not to spend their first nights in a tent close to home at some kind of public or commercial campground, everything works out fine most of the time. Okay, so what happens when most of the time isn't in effect? Things can potentially get bad, and when it happens, it can be a very big and unpleasant deal. And when that happens, it's usually caused by, what else, the weather. Wait a minute, one might say. Sleeping bags have temperature ratings. I just need to buy a rating that will handle cold weather, right? When it comes to sleeping in the outdoors, particularly in wilderness conditions, sleeping bag temperature ratings could be called educated guesses. The outdoor company REI has a web page that describes this in detail. The link is in the description. The website says, quote, Temperature ratings are estimates, not gospel. And real-world comfort probably won't match lab-tested temperature ratings because of all the variables that a lab can't simulate. I agree. Three times I found myself definitely feeling cold when the temperature fell to my sleeping bag's rating. More on this in a minute. So, this is our topic. What can we do to make sure we sleep warm when the temperature unexpectedly gets cold? But first, we should ask what are these variables exactly? It's going to sound like a no-brainer when I say there are big differences between car camping and hiking on foot, but for the purposes of our topic, a couple of them are worth taking a look at. When car camping, we can sleep in our vehicle or even drive home if conditions get bad. Car campers also can select a kind of sleeping bag that most long-distance hikers would not want anything to do with in 2024. Here's an example. I found these in the small outdoor section of a much larger store. Each one is rated for 30 degrees Fahrenheit and weighs about 4 pounds. Each one is about 12 inches across as shown here because they cannot be compressed. I bet a nickel they would in fact work pretty good at 30 degrees. And I say that because long ago, I used sleeping bags like this, and they work fine in cold weather. In 2024, it would be hard to find a hiker who would want to deal with a sleeping bag like this and the external frame pack it would take to carry it. If we're doing all of our traveling on foot, we want things to be lighter and easier to carry. And if we're walking lots of miles at a place like the Appalachian Trail, a quick retreat to our car is highly unlikely. We're going to have to get by with what we're carrying. Among those variables REI mentioned, like I said, weather changes are the most common, specifically when a cold front rolls in. Wait a minute, one might say. I only camp in summer. A cold front is no big deal. Yes, that is true if, and mainly only if, we are not camping at higher elevations. And that's the issue with the Appalachian Trail. If we keep hiking and keep hiking, we definitely will spend a large percentage of our time at higher elevations along long stretches of the trail. This creates the glitch. If our elevation is high enough, even during the height of summer, a cold front can make the temperature fall by 30 degrees Fahrenheit. This could be a problem if we expect nothing but balmy, warm, 75 degree Fahrenheit weather day and night. And more than a few people have learned this the hard way. How much elevation are we talking about anyway? I live in Ohio, where the average elevation is 850 feet above sea level. Some parts of the state are below 500 feet above sea level. In the winter, temperatures can fall 50 degrees Fahrenheit in a single day at that elevation. In the summer, however, a cold front might not do much more than raise the humidity at that elevation. If we are on the Appalachian Trail anywhere south of Maryland and north of Pennsylvania, we will be at 3,000 or 4,000 feet above sea level a high percentage of the time and sometimes will be even higher than that. 
The AT runs through 90 miles of the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. That park is considered one of the easiest sections of the AT. It has an average elevation of 3,000 feet above sea level. I have spent a night in my tent close to sea level and spent the very next night in Shenandoah National Park. This was in the summer. The night was very warm outside the park, but cool enough to be chilly at night in the park's hills. For most aspiring AT through hikers, there is a very good case for carrying a sleeping bag rated at 20 degrees. And one reason for that being a very good case is because the average aspiring AT through hiker will not complete the entire trail. In 2024, the AT Conservancy says around 75% do not complete it. This reduces the odds of those hikers being exposed to freezing temperatures or near freezing temperatures. The bottom line is that if our sleeping bag or quilt isn't up to the job, some kind of expedient might see us through. For example, I made an AT section hike in Virginia one October and experienced near freezing temperatures at night. The daylight high was around 50 degrees Fahrenheit and every night it was in the mid 30s. I was carrying a sleeping bag rated for 35 degrees and one night I woke up shivering. I was wearing a base layer, a fleece pullover, and a fleece hoodie. The only thing I had left to put on was a Frog Togs rain jacket, which solved the problem that night. I had considered carrying a down vest, but decided I didn't want to carry another seven ounces. I would have been better off if I had carried it. While backpack bow hunting in Ohio in November, I have experienced a lot of freezing weather and snow. I was carrying a 30 degree bag when I started these trips. I was dressed for the weather and was curious to see if that bag could do the job. It could not. It wasn't warm enough. For a very long time, I have learned to do at least something to hedge my bets against possible trouble. As a result, I had carried a very thin fleece sleeping bag liner with me on that trip and I decided to use it. It solved the problem. I had a similar experience in the winter with snow on the ground with a 20 degree down sleeping bag. The temperature was in the 20s and that bag by itself wasn't enough. The company SOL sells bivvies, which are basically made of space blanket material or fabric, and a long time ago I bought a couple. I was carrying one made of fabric weighing about 8 ounces. I used it as a sleeping bag liner that night and it solved the problem. On that October 8 trip, I was carrying another SOL bivy, basically made of mylar or something similar. I had cut it down so it would pull up to my waist. I was using it the night I woke up cold. I would have been better off to cut it off at my shoulders. That model is long enough to pull over my head. I once tested that and got condensation inside the bivy. I got no condensation after I cut it down. One factor in all this is money. If we have enough money, we can buy one sleeping bag to handle cold weather and another one to handle extra cold weather. In 2024, two highly respected outdoor companies sell sleeping bags and systems that range from $300 to nearly $600 each for what I would guess are the most popular models. But there's a potential glitch. One company sells nothing with a rating lower than 10 degrees Fahrenheit. If we want a bag rated for 15 degrees Fahrenheit, the other company's price jumps up to more than $700 in 2024. And if we want a bag rated for 5 degrees or lower, the prices jump to over $800 and higher. As I have said before, I want outdoor companies to succeed. But prices like that are beyond the reach of a number of people. In my own case, I just refuse to spend that much money, and I always have. But I also avoid sub-zero weather hiking and camping. There are a number of backwoods 20th century tips to help sleep warmer, and none of them is a good option for a long-distance hiker on a trail like the AT. One tip is to bury ourselves in dead leaves. It is surprising how few dead leaves I have seen on the ground along the AT. And in the kind of weather we're talking about, any dead leaves are likely to be covered in snow. Another old tip is build a big campfire. Earl Schaefer, the very first AT through hiker, did that more than once on his first two through hikes. 
but in 2024, campfires are banned on long stretches of the AT. And if we get modern synthetic clothes, tents, or sleeping bags close to a fire, any stray spark can burn a hole in the fabric. Sleeping with a bottle filled with hot water is another old tip. Heating up an entire liter of water is going to take a lot of fuel, relatively speaking, on a long trail. The kind of fuel that could last five days for routine trail cooking, if we cook at all. A stove that burns Coleman fuel, also known as white gas, would in fact heat up a liter of water pretty quickly. While they were once common along the AT, everything I see suggests they have completely disappeared from the trail in 2024. That's because canister stoves and even alcohol stoves and esmet stoves are lighter and easy to deal with. What sleeping pad to use to stay warm is a whole other topic. I covered it in another video. The link is in the description. We should note that in the American West, things can get much worse on average than along most of the AT or in many of the eastern states in the U.S. For example, Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming has an average elevation of nearly 8,000 feet above sea level. I was shivering my first night in Yellowstone in the summer when I was 10 years old on a family vacation. I've been there four times since. On my second ever trip to Yellowstone, I took a sleeping bag and a wool blanket. This in the middle of the summer. Multiple spots in the American West are over 10,000 feet above sea level, and blizzards can strike as late as April and as early as October that I know of. If I lived in the West, those are the times I would avoid or limit hiking and camping. And now, we're once again done. I frequently post news stories online, on Facebook, and on Twitter, or whatever the heck they're calling Twitter these days, and the links are in the description. On my channel page, I have a number of playlists containing more than 80 videos describing a variety of topics on how to keep ourselves out of trouble and keep moving along trails like the AT. And as always, thanks a million for watching.